Hi everybody, and very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today in the video, guys, we are fl- flying at 39,000 feet. Suddenly, our engine fails. One of our engine fails. What do we as pilots have to do immediately when that happens? How do we deal with it and what kind of precautions do we need to think about? Stay tuned. 131016, Now, Engine failure in cruise is different than if we have an engine failure during takeoff. Now, I already talked about <laughs> I've already talked about what we do in case of an engine failure on takeoff in a previous episode. And if you're really interested in seeing how we actually deal with it, how me and a colleague deal with it, well then get the Mentor Aviation app and the engine failure collection right now. You'll be able to see it in 360, it's just like sitting in the cockpit. Now, in cruise, it's different, and the reason it's different is because we are above our single-engine service ceiling. And what that means is that a two-engine jet aircraft is designed to be able to fly at our, you know, up to our maximum cruise level, which is 41,000 feet in the case of the 737, using two engines. But if we lose one of those two engines, we do not have enough thrust to maintain that altitude. So this means that we need to start descending. Okay. The single engine service ceiling, as in the altitude we can maintain on only one engine, tends to be between 24,000 and 26,000 feet, depending on how heavy we are. So this means that we have to deal with the engine failure in cruise fairly quickly when it happens. Now the first indications that we'll get of a engine failure in cruise is that the lower display unit on our, um, in our cockpit is going to lit up. Okay, the lower display units is below the um, display units that shows our primary engine indications. And the reason that that is blanked by then is because we blank it when we've started the engines so that we will quickly see if there is any exceedance happening. Because it's much easier for a pilot to recognize that a whole screen lights up than if M1 of the uh, individual instrumentations on the screen starts exceeding a value. So the pop-up feature is probably the first thing that's going to come. Now, the second one is going to be that the aileron will start to displace towards the uh, running engine. Okay, And this is because the autopilot in the 737 does not have rudder authority. Okay, It doesn't control the rudder. It controls the bank and it controls the the elevators and the yaw damper takes care of the rudder. But it doesn't do anything when it comes to an engine failure. So this means that as the now working engine is, let's say that it's the right engine that's working, the left engine has failed, the working engine is now pushing forward, the left is not, it means that the aircraft wants to try to yaw towards the left, and the autopilot will try to counteract that using aileron. So it's going to start turning to the right in order to keep the aircraft from yawing. Right, so it will do that more and more and more. And if we do nothing, at one point or another, the autopilot will realize that it cannot control it and it will disengage. And the, the second thing that happens after that is that the aircraft is going to snap out of the, the, um, the level flight that it's maintaining, possibly losing control. So it is crucial that the pilot recognizes this very quickly. There will be more indications of the engine failure as well. After a couple of seconds, we're going to get a master caution ELEC, which will indicate that the the generator has popped offline on the failed side. But anyway, um, whenever this happens, we always have to fly the aircraft to aviate, navigate, communicate. If you haven't heard that before, you're going to hear it many, many, many times in your flight training. All right. So what do we do then? Well, when we see that the aileron is starting to displace and we watch, we see that the pop-up has come, we can see that the engine has failed, then what we do is you push the rudder, as in the rudder pedal, on the downside of the aileron. So if the aileron is displacing like this, well then we push the right side. And when we do, nice and slowly, the aileron is going to start to level again because we now have rudder on the correct side making sure that the aircraft continues to fly straight. And when it's completely level, it means that we have the correct amount of rudder in. That's number one, okay, that's to fly the aircraft. The second part of flying the aircraft is realizing that we're now flying single engine above our single engine service ceiling. This means that the aircraft can 
either maintain its altitude or maintain its speed, not both. If you watch my episode that I did about what happens to an aircraft if it flies too high, you know that at our you know, maximum cruise level or even at our normal cruise level, we have a very tiny margin between the high speed stall and the low speed stall. So this would indicate that even if we now have the aircraft flying level under control with the correct amount of rudder in, we still need to do something before the speed becomes too low. Because when the aircraft is flying without the pilot engaged, in um, altitude hold mode or in VNAV path mode, well then it will not automatically descend when it feels that the speed is too low. It won't do a reversion, which is something we'll cover later on when we talk about the autopilot. It will just maintain the altitude. And this is bad because if it does and we don't do anything, the speed will creep back slower and slower and slower and at some point we're going to end up with a stick shaker or buffeting and we're in a fully blown stall at a high level with only one engine and that is a situation we do not want to be in. So what do we do then? Well, we have to do something called a drift down maneuver. Okay, A drift down maneuver is basically trying to maintain the altitude as high as possible for as long as possible with the available thrust we have. And we always do that both to maximize the range so that we can get as far as possible but also to avoid flying into any mountains that might be below us. Uh, if we are flying in Europe or in most parts of the United States this is not a huge problem since the single engine service ceiling tends to be about 24 to 26,000 feet. The highest peak that we have in Europe is 18,400 feet. So it's very rare to have a problem to maintain an altitude that keeps us safe in terrain. But if we're flying down in the Himalayas, for example, that's a completely different thing. Then you will have peaks, K2, Mount Everest and so on, that will go well through our single engine service ceiling. And it becomes a completely different thing to make sure that we keep the altitude as high as possible for as long as possible. Now, the way to do this is that the pilot flying always have the face of flight page up on the FMC CDU. That means that it's in cruise, it's going to be the cruise page up. Now, on the cruise page in the CDU, you will find an engine out prompt. Okay. Now, if we push the button next to that, that will illuminate the engine out page. And the engine out page is an information only page, but there's a lot of very good information in there. For example, we will get the maximum continuous N1 value. That's the maximum thrust that we can take out of the remaining engine while keeping it still safe and secure. We will get the engine out speed, which is the best speed to maintain in case of an engine failure. And we'll also, crucially, get our single engine service ceiling. So what we do is we have a quick look at that. And we see that our single engine service ceiling is, for example, 25,600 feet. Well then, the next thing to do is to set 25,000 feet, so the next level below the maximum, sorry, the single engine service ceiling. 25,000 feet, press level change, put the single engine speed out, the engine out speed, so that might be, say, 235 knots. Then, disconnect the outer throttle, if it's still connected, and set max continuous thrust. Okay, so that probably means increasing the thrust slightly on the live engine. So what we've tried to, or what we have managed to do by doing it in this order, is that we've told the autopilot that A, we want you to descend to 25,000 feet. B, we want you to do that at the best speed, 235 knots. And C, we are going to give you as much thrust as we have available with the running engine. So this means that the autopilot in level change is going to try to maintain this, the altitude first. So the speed will decrease and will maintain altitude until it hits 235 knots. And when it hits 235 knots, then it's going to lower the nose to keep 235 knots and use as much thrust as possible to both high, keep the altitude and the speed. But it won't be able to because we're too high. So initially it will lower the nose and it will descend at a slightly higher descent rate. But as we're getting closer and closer to our single engine service ceiling, well then the amount of thrust we have is also going to be relatively higher. So the, uh, the descent rate will be less and less. So it means that we will be doing a curve that looks a little bit 
like this. It will descend less and less until when we reach 25,600 feet, it will actually level off. So we're going to have to take off some thrust in order to go down to 25,000 feet. But it means that we're maintaining the altitude and speed. We're keeping the aircraft safe, so we now have the correct amount of rudder. We have the speed that we want to keep the aircraft safe, and we're descending at the slowest possible rate to avoid any mountains below us, and also to get as much range as possible out. Now, you might ask yourself, well, what if you're flying down in the Himalayas then? What if you're flying past um, Mount Everest and you lose an engine? Well, the operators who operate in areas like that, they need to have something called an escape route. So they need to have a plan at any given point during this flight. If we fail an engine at this point, well, then you are going to need to look at our escape route and turn towards a specific direction. That is to make sure that the aircraft is always safe. If that's not possible to do, well, then the flight route won't be flight planned over that point. It's as easy as that. We always have to have a way to making sure that we can clear any obstacles with at least a thousand feet along our route all the time. Well, how do we know them? How do we know how high the mountains actually are? Well, in our electronic flight bags, we have high level charts and low level charts for the entire area we're flying over. And on those in big letters, you can see what the grid mora is. That's the minimum on route altitude in that grid. Okay, so if by looking at that, we know that, for example, when I'm flying in over the Alps, I know that the highest grid mora there is 18,400 feet. But I can look down and I see there's maybe 16,000 feet where we are right now, 14,000 feet, and in most of Europe, it's less than 5,000 feet. Okay, now if I don't have time to go up and try to find this low level chart inside of my electronic flight bag, then on our flight plans, we have as part of the flight plan, the minimum on route altitude at every given waypoint. So we can just look on our navigation display, see what the next waypoint is, look it up in our flight plan and say, okay, here, the grid more is actually 15,000 feet. So we will always have a way to quickly find out, but it's always good, and this is airmanship for you guys, to be aware where you are. You know, that, this is why when we're flying on route, we're not just sitting and you know, reading a magazine. We're actually looking outside a little bit, knowing that, okay, I'm in France now, I'm in southern France, I am just about to fly in over the Alps, so the Mora is going to come up, there's going to be higher terrain below me. What if I have an engine failure? Or if I have a rapid depressurization and emergency descent? That's probably going to be even more limiting, because then we normally descend to 10,000 feet. But, of course, if we're over Mont Blanc and it's 18,400 feet safety height, we can't do that. We have to stop our descent at that altitude. So it's a good idea and it's good airmanship to always know approximately where you are and what the Mora is. And also, this is something I tell to all my cadets which I'm training, if you're bored, look out, see what airports are around, try to find out a little bit about them. So if we have any kind of problem, we have an idea of where to go. This is just good airmanship, guys. Okay? But basically, that's drift down procedure for you. Um, like I said before, if you are interested in knowing more about different types of failures, inside of the Mentor Aviation app, the way that I've done it is you have collections. Okay? The 360 collections that I've made will enable you to see the entire cockpit, me, my co-pilot, what we do, what switches we touch, everything like that. And together with those 360 collections where I actually show you how we do it, we, I also have um, instruction videos like this one where I tell you, you know, the, the theory behind it. So the way that I want to deduce it is you go in, you watch the briefing video first so you know what it is you're looking for and then you check out the 360 collection. And if you tend to have a headset like this, and you put that on, there is a possibility inside of the app to, to put, to see it in full 360, it will be just like you're sitting on the jump seat together with me when I'm executing these maneuvers. All right? Now you can watch it without these as well. You just use your uh, finger and you pan around to see what's going on, or you can move the entire phone and that will scroll as well. So check out the app, Go in there, talk to me in the chat if you have specific questions, or there are other pilots or other enthusiasts in there that are happy to help as well.
Also, check out the playlist that I have, that I've done all of the other failures that I've been discussing on the channel before. I'm sure that you're going to find something interesting there. And if you like this, if you like the channel, then I want you to leave a like on the video. I want you to subscribe to the channel. And remember, when you subscribe, hit the little notification bell. Because if not, you will not be notified when, or you might not be notified when I do a live stream or when I send out a bonus video or indeed when I send out a normal video. So like, subscribe and hit the notification bell. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.